So, third lecture of the session, Dr. Steven Target, that is uh, my colleague in the sport medicine department of Aspetar. He's a British uh, sport medicine physician, but he spent a significant part of his life in uh, the fantastic land of New Zealand. He's the clinical lead of uh, Aspetar Athlete Screening Center, and therefore I think he's the best person to talk about Aspetar Athlete Screening Model. Right, thank you very much, Cristiano. Um, so my talk today is going to be about the periodic health assessment of athletes and to look at the Aspetar screening model. So I have no disclosures to make. So I'm going to divide my talk into three sections. The first one is to look at factors to, us, to consider when designing a template for a periodic health assessment, to look at the Aspetar screening model for professional footballers, and finally, to go through some of the lessons we've learned from performing PHAs at Aspatar. So when you're designing a screening program, the three questions you need to ask in order. The first one is, why are you screening in the first place? What are you looking for? Then you need to consider the population you're looking at, so who you're looking at. And when you've done that, you can ask, how can I perform this? So for the, the most basic question when you're doing a screening program is, um, is, is, is it going to make the sport safe? And um, that's what it be, that's cardiac screening, that's what it's been covered by Carmen very nicely. So the, probably the three, other, three most other common questions to ask when you look at a screening program is to review the current injuries and illnesses. Uh, for example, an athlete with, uh, who plays a jumping sport uh, has persistent patellar tendinopathy to see his current symptoms and to check he's doing his rehab program properly and someone with asthma to check uh, their, their symptoms and also their, using their medication. To identify occult illness or injury. Now those of you that deal with athletes know they don't always tell the truth. So sometimes you only find about that niggling groin pain they've had the last six or eight weeks at a one-on-one -on -one assessment as part of a periodic medical. Um, and also uh, it could be true conditions that are not known about like iron deficiency anemia that may affect performance. And finally, the, the other common reason to perform a medical is to identify risk factors for injury or illness. And a lot of research has been done to this over the last few years, particularly to look at risk factors for the common injuries like ACL injuries and hamstring injuries. But there are several reasons why this may not be a successful strategy to identify people who are going to get injured. So the first thing is that a few modified risk factors have been described, the commonest ones being previous history of injury or age or female gender in ACL injuries. The second one is the cutoff values of some of these tests are not that discriminatory. So for example, the drop squat tests for ACL injuries, no matter where you draw the line for the value of the test, there are always some false positives or false negatives. Second, a third thing is over time, things change. So when you look at an athlete pre-season period before they start training, you assess them again immediately pre-season and towards the end of the season, things will look different. And the final reason is that for each injury, with it, say, for example, an ACL injury, there are several different, different issues that can cause the, an injury. So it could be getting fatigued towards the end of the season, it could be the, the interaction between the shoe and the surface they're playing on, or it could be because they're getting knocked um, while they're going for a ball. So just looking at one risk factor pre-season may not be that successful. So although looking at these factors during a periodic health assessment may identify issues that need to be looked at, ongoing monitoring through the season is an equally important part of injury prevention. So there are several other reasons that could be useful as part of a periodic health assessment. So building rapport with the athlete, often it's the only time the doctor, the physio gets to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with the athlete, away from the other athletes. Um, to look at the medications they're doing, taking, to check it's not it's WADA compliant, and also to educate the athlete about their WADA obligations. To look at some baseline tests for post-injury comparison, for example, neuropsych testing for head injuries. To dis discuss any of the health concerns the athlete might have, maybe some performance measures such as VO2 max immunizations, and also some lifestyle education, such as smoking, safe driving, diet, and sleep and recovery issues. So when you've, done, when you've looked at why you want to do the, the, the screening, you need to look at the particular population you're looking at. So for a contact sport, you may want to ask about their previous history of concussions, and maybe do some neuropsych testing for comparison post-injury. 
Each sport will have their own different sorts of injuries. So, for, for example, volleyball, you need to look at overuse shoulder injuries associated with spiking and serving, knee pain associated with jumping and landing, and also ankle injuries. And for sport like wrestling, you might want to inquire or look for contagious skin diseases that might prevent taking part in sport. Uh, adolescent athletes have growth plates, and as these become active and get softer, they're prone to injury. This may need to be considered when you're dealing with a group of youth athletes. And in a female athlete, one of the issues you may want to consider is a reduced energy deficiency syndrome, formerly known as female athlete triad, and all the, all the issues that arise from this. This particularly in uh, long distance athletes or athletes who need to make weight for certain sports. And then looking at where you are in the world, some of the issues around here, for example, might be vitamin D deficiency, iron deficiency, thalassemia, exercise in the heat, hepatitis B, and athletes who want to fast during Ramadan. These all may need to be considered as part of your assessment. So once you've worked out why you're why assessing someone, what you want to achieve from the assessment, who you're looking at, you can then put together your template. The history is a really important part of that. Um, if you're doing some examination, you, you, me you measure, taking some measurements, be selective and make sure you do them properly so they can be reproduced. You may want to add in some special tests. And then you need to work out when you're going to do the assessment. There's some value in doing an assessment at the end of the season so that issues can be addressed to be sorted out over the off-season. Who's going to do it? Is it the doctor? Is it the physio? Is it a combination of different people? And it's important also when you're taking information from an athlete and may give it to the coach, they understand that this may happen. You have informed consent for that. And at the end of the assessment, make sure you have a proper summary with some action points and know who's responsible for the different action points. But despite going through these processes, there are several other factors that may affect what you can or can't do. Whether you have access to expertise or certain equipment, financial constraints can stop a lot of places doing what they want to do, and having access to the team can be a real problem. I know as a, a medical practitioner in the pre-season period, the fitness trainer and the coach both want access to the players at the same time, so it can be difficult to convince them spending some time with the physician is worthwhile. So what do we found in Asp so what, how do we screen our, our professional football players at Aspatar? So we, this is heavily based on the FIFA PCMA pre-competition medical assessment. Uh, so we usually do them in the, in the early pre-season and early season period, unless they have a new contract and they, they get a medical before they sign. We ask them to arrive at 8 o'clock in the morning fasted, and most of them do turn up around that time. Uh, they spend about 45 minutes with our experienced screening nurses, have a, a detailed history, do the vital signs, visual acuity, and spirometry. They'll also see the dentist for a proper assessment. Uh, they'll have the cardiac screening, which you've heard about already. And they'll see the physiotherapist for about an hour and a half for a battery of musculoskeletal tests that we think are football specific. So I'm thankful to Andrea Mosler for these slides. So they're grouped into four different sorts of tests. The first one are pain provocation tests, um, looking at hip impingement and Fabers tests, and the, and the long leg and short, short leg squeeze tests. And these, the pain is rated on a numeric rating scale. They have hip internal rotation in prone and supine, hip abduction and bent knee fallout and ankle dorsiflexion, so range of movement tests. They also have some strength tests looking at handheld eccentric adduction and abduction, as well as some quads and hamstring eccentric and concentric testing. And recently been doing the eccentric hamstring strengthening on a gnaw board using EMG. And the fibre group test is a functional movement screen based on that of anaphrone with nine different elements. So that's the morning for the players. In the afternoon, they'll come and see one of the sports physicians. They'll review the results from all the morning's tests, do a more in-depth history and a physical examination. And at the end of that, a summary report will be provided to the club with recommendations for any action points. So what have we found during a screening at Aspatar? So Arnold Backen is a, is a physiotherapist who's just doing a PhD, and she's just published the first paper in the British Journal of Sports Medicine with some of the results, looking at two years of screening of the elite football players, so 559 football players. And for the purpose of this paper, any health condition is described as anything discovered on screening needs further treatment, assessment, or follow-up. 
So the 559 footballers, if you look on the left there, from the general medical assessment, 93% of players had things that met the, met the condition for a health condition. If you take away a vitamin D, however, that's down to 30% of athletes. On the right, another 30% of athletes have musculoskeletal issues, and there were 8% of athletes had issues on the cardiac screening. And it's not surprising from a musculoskeletal point of view, those parts of the body that have common injuries in football were the most common, so hip and groin, thigh, knee, and ankle. So this is another slide from Andrew Moser looking at, so this is the normative data of ratio of strength of adduction to abduction of the hip. And the mean in the footballers is 1.2, the mean ratio. Compared with ice hockey, which is 0.95, so there, there can be a sport-specific um, change um, for different measures. The other reason this slides up is to remind me to talk that we now have normative data for all these uh, physiotherapy measures. So it's really handy when you have a player coming in, you can compare them with other athletes in the same sport. And it can also be very useful sometimes with a new signing coming in, doesn't tell you the truth, you can, it can pick up injuries um, that would otherwise go missed. What about some of the blood tests? So a busy slide, sorry. So top left shows that 32% of female athletes and 9% of male athletes have non-anemic iron deficiency. And if you look at the bottom right table, of that group, compared with the Asian and Caucasian, the black athletes have twice the rate of non anemic iron deficiency in Arabic, almost two and a half times the rate. And the top right is, is um, iron deficiency anemia, uh, females are 10% and male 0.2%. And this is gathered from all our sports of uh, almost 4,000 screening assessments. What about vitamin D deficiency? It's quite a trendy thing these days. Uh, with no exception here, only 10% of our athletes of vitamin D sufficient, with 70% being deficient. Uh, we just realized recently that we had picked up several cases of keratoconus, which is an eye disease where the cornea gets thin and can be prone to, to being misshapen and cause loss of sight. So we, we discovered that over 20 of, 20 of Asperger patients have this condition, um, and 20% of those are quite advanced. Now, we're not sure at this stage which came through screening, which came through other channels. So it's something we're going to look at over the next 12 months. And you're having a talk tomorrow on the dental care of athletes, but just a snapshot, look at over 300 athletes we've seen in one month, only 14% didn't require treatment. 75% had caries and fillings. So there's significant gum and, and uh, disease, gum and tooth disease in these, the group of athletes. So take home messages. There's no universal template that suits all situations. So look at, you, look at what you want to achieve and who you're looking at, and then you can design your own template. The main benefits of a periodic health assessment are probably to detect current problems rather than predict who's going to get injured. And athlete monitoring through the season is an equally important part of injury prevention. Thank you very much.